Hello, welcome back to Open Relationships. I'm your host, Andrea Miller. I am super excited about our show today. I spoke with Mastin Kip, and whew, we got into it. It became very personal for me. And gosh, the key takeaways are if you are feeling anxiety or that feeling in your chest or you've got like aches and pains in your body that you just can't get rid of, this show is for you. And there is so much more, but honestly, we really got into it in a way that is so practical and maybe even revolutionary. So I'm going to introduce our guest, Mastin Kip. Always love that big studio audience welcoming uh, us to our show. I am delighted to introduce an old friend, Mastin Kip. Mastin is a best-selling author, speaker, and creator of functional life coaching for people who are seeking rapid transformation in their lives. He has been a rec- he has been recognized as a thought leader for the next generation by Oprah and appears alongside Tony Robbins, Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, and Brene Brown as part of Oprah's Super Soul 100, a collection of awakened leaders who are using their voices to elevate humanity. Through his writing courses, seminars, and retreats, Mastin has worked with over 2 million people in over 100 countries worldwide. And his latest book is now out. It's called Reclaim Your Nervous System. It's fantastic. It's so practical and filled with, I mean, I'm just going to give a little shout out for Han Solo, uh, Star Trek, and Cinnabon fans. There's a lot (laughs) of good stuff in there. Uh, Don't let the name fool you. Uh, Welcome, Mastin. Thanks for being on our show. I'm happy to be here. And did you just mention Star Wars and Star Trek in the same sentence? We're going to start a war. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, you talked about, uh, what is it, the, who is it, uh, Picard and Han Solo. Come on. Yeah, it's true. I I did, I did. (laughs) I love that you noticed that. Yeah. Fact checking. I'm going to fact check. Yeah, out of context though, you know, that's, that, those are fighting words, you know. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well. (laughs) But I did. It's true. I did. Uh, I, yeah, no, but it is a delight. And, you know, as we were joking about just before the show, you drop the F-bomb and you keep it real. And in a in a book that um, has so much of a practical impact for people, it's just it's refreshing to that. It's it's also fun in life. That's not easy to pull off. So congrats. well, thank you. I tried hard at that. So thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. And we're going to come back. I really I do want to dig in and I'm, I'm going to say it just up top, you've got a big ambitious goal for this book to get 100,000 copies in people's hands because you are so freaking passionate about what you've learned and the, and the hard ways you've learned to help people. And that's why I do want to come back to that. But I, I want to set the, the stage here for people that aren't familiar with you and your story. And especially when I think about your courage to tell hard truths. And when I think about healing from trauma, really acknowledging hard truths and talking about hard truths to me feels like it is a absolute need to have. And it's one of the scary, I mean, especially as somebody who's also had to to deal with a lot of trauma, it's like, oh, I don't want to deal with the hard truths, but you got to deal with the hard truths. So you have an extraordinary story. And just again, to set the stage, you come from a very famous wealthy family you hit rock bottom as an addict with nowhere to go. You went through a terrible phase where you couldn't walk. You went through what was what seemed like terrible suffering, protracted doubt, hurt, and despair. And through tremendous work, you've become whole, extremely successful, and very impactful in your work. And I would contend entirely because you faced your demons and you told really hard truths. Mm. Is that, a, yeah, think, is that an yeah. accurate to set the stage? Hearing it back, that sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I never thought about it that way, but yeah, it sounds accurate to me. Well, and, a beautiful summary. And well, and 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 thank you. And and it, I'm so moved by your story, as I was saying at the at you know in our little kind of pre prep call. So let me just rewind a little bit more because I do think, again, in the spirit of telling hard truths, that I want others to go. Oh well, if he can do it. I can do it, and if the if the intention is is to heal and set ourselves free emotionally, so you've been super brave speaking about being part of a very famous, very wealthy family as a member of the Dupont family. You write that you felt your family was a perpetrator. You describe feeling the need to atone as part of a family who did a lot of good, yes, but who is also responsible for tremendous death and destruction. You describe how the DuPonts were part of the Manhattan Project, which dropped the atomic bombs on 
um, Hiroshima and Nasaki uh, made gunpowder, were in business with the Nazis, like bad stuff, and saved millions of lives, created Kevlar uh, for, uh, you know, your, your science nerds out there. The American flag on the moon was made by DuPont. Um, so a really kind of conflicting background. And I start with this because, like I said, for so many of us, it's hard to tell those hard truths in private. And you've been so brave in talking about them and the impact on you in public. So I'm curious how how doing that has impacted your relationship with your parents, your like cousins, aunties, and uncles, what price have you paid to tell those hard truths? Whew, what a, what a, that's a great question to lead off. Um, and I actually haven't been asked about this, so I'm, I'm happy to speak to it. Um, and I haven't been asked about it because I haven't really put it out there until now. So um, thank you for this opportunity. So uh, in terms of um, the DuPont family, like like I, I'm so honored by the lineage of the DuPont family and also conflicted by it. Just like you can think about America in general, like we've done such good and also such harm. Um, so and something is not either all good or all bad. However, it's curious that a six foot five white male from Kansas would be in the trauma informed space. And as I was in 2020 not able to walk, which we can talk more about that, um, part of what I was coming to the realization was is that there was a part of me that was like generational that was like, I don't want one more DuPont harming this world. And that felt like it wasn't mine. And I was able to connect with a cousin of mine, Lexi, and um, kind of bond over this and realize a lot of uh, the family who are our generation and below feel that burden uh, in a different way than previous generations. And I've had a lot of conversations with my family about it. And I would say my mom, uh, which is the side that the DuPonts come from, and I are on the same page. Other people in the family who are usually older tend to want to focus on the good and and dismiss the bad, which is kind of like on brand with that generation in general, because that's what they were taught. Like if you think about World War II and the end of World War II, so much trauma happening. And we were just kind of like, you know, the, the soldiers were told to kind of suck it up and deal with it. And they were blamed because they had shell shock, not PTSD back then. Even General Patton in World War II would blame the soldiers for not being able to handle the war. That's well established. And so I think that it's only now that we're able to reconcile. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to like, I don't believe in like tearing down statues and saying, hey, like this is not a part of our history and we should forget about it. I think that will cause it to repeat. I think it's about honoring our history and understanding the good and also understanding how my family has contributed to good and the bad. And when we look at a lot of the movements that are happening out there today, uh, the big, uh, there's been a major focus on uh, marginalized communities as there should be. I haven't seen a lot of people who have been a part of perpetrator families uh, raise their hand and say, hey, I want to end the cycle on this side. And so I felt like it was important for me to myself, for my own integrity, to be able to honor that within myself and then quickly realize, well, I can't hold this by myself. I should probably let people know also so that there's context to my behavior because um, in many ways, like, you know, the DuPont family has done such incredible things um, and yet has also caused the death and been a part of the death of millions of people. And so that's a conflicting, that's a conflicting experience in my nervous system. And I think acknowledging that and naming that, uh, my system relaxes and also saying, hey, like, that's also not on me. Like, I wasn't here for that, but it's, there's generations that live within me that I come from. And my ancestors were scientists and business people. So hello, like, I'm doing exactly what they, sh what they were doing, but hopefully in a different way. Um, yeah. And so that's really been a big piece of my awakening. And also I'm very aware that I have white male privilege, which I don't think privilege or white people are bad. Um, I think it's all about how you use it. And I think that my goal has been to use whatever privilege I have to um, basically create as much symmetry, not asymmetry in the world, and to just get this message out there as much as possible. And I don't think that's a woke thing to say. I think that the term is um, very overused and also appropriated. Uh, I think it's just true. <laughs> it's just true. Um, and so anyone who uh, denies that by claiming it's woke or whatever, I think it's uh, there's there's more to the conversation than that for sure. But I think it's important to acknowledge our the context from which we came, whether it's someone who's coming from a marginalized community or someone who's coming from a, a privileged family who did good but also did a lot of harm. Well, and I love that. I just I I sincerely I'm I'm so grateful for your courage and honesty and and really the integrity that you've insisted on for yourself. Because even as you started speaking and, and you made the um, analogy to America, like the Amer America is the greatest experiment ever, 
right? And yet it, it there are there are dark spots and shadows. And and when I think about um, our collective unwillingness to look at those dark spots and shadows and how Native Americans were treated and so many black and you know enslaved people were treated and and on and on, it's like it's hard to move forward. I mean, that's why it's amazing to me when I think about. Um, in Africa about, you know, various countries within Africa having these truth and reconciliation um, conferences where it's just, it's putting the truth out there and letting it, letting it sit and be acknowledged. And it's like, there's something profoundly healing in that mechanical process. Agreed. And I, I also think it's utterly patriotic to talk about the full history of our country, not the positive version of the history of our country. And that's not anti-American. That's not anti-patriotic. It's actually the most patriotic thing that we can do in many ways because it's the truth, right? And so I think that, I think if we're not talking about the truth, what are we, it's propaganda, right? So we want to make sure that we're talking about what's true. And what's true is we displaced and killed millions of people to take over this country. Uh, there's uh, legitimate trauma because of that. I talk about this in the book. I talk about how your zip code uh, many, many times more than your genetic code can ex uh, determine your uh, your quality and life length. Um, and that's been published and, and very well researched. And so I think it's important for us to be able to understand that. And it doesn't have to be this big, like beating people over the head with all this guilt and shame. It's just like, yo, like this is what happened. This is what we did. Let's not delete history. Let's have a conversation and let's make our behavior aligned with these intentions also so that we're not just talking about it because uh, true reparation or forgiveness doesn't happen without um, behavior change. Well, so and, we have and to, and yeah. honesty. I mean, just saying, okay. I mean, and that I mean, it's a good segue, I think, to trauma and intergenerational trauma. And I want to be really careful. I I really uh, try to to create an environment where we're not using jargony terms because I think it's so easy to lose people. Like when you start using jargony terms, um, and, and yet intergenerational trauma is the phrase that's really common in our industry. So can you talk a little bit about that in very simple language and, um, you know, and just really getting into your book when it comes to what people need to know? Because I think a lot of people will hear, you know, especially probably the older generation, probably more men, you know, I'm just not to be sexist, but, you know, I feel like there are a lot of like stoic guys who are like, man, nah, nah, intergenerational trauma that doesn't describe me. Um, like, who, who does it describe and what is it and what do people need to know? Because I, ultimately, I feel like that's at the heart of what you faced head on, starting with telling the truth. And there's a lot more to it, but let's just start with intergenerational trauma, what it is and um, you know why it's important to so many people. Sure. So I think the work of Rachel Yehuda helps us understand generational trauma. She was the She's the brilliant researcher and scientist who, who helped us uh, study uh, Holocaust survivors and their families and really was able to map genetic expression and how genetic expression was able to change or epigenetic expression was able to change via uh, through generation um, because of trauma. And so it's, it's well-researched and well-proven. And, um, and so, so it's in the literature. You can look it up. It's, I cite it in my book. It's, I'm, I, I have more citations in this book than any book I've ever written. Um, so, but basically what we understand is a generational trauma to be very simply is the experiences of, uh, a mother and a father, how they're raised, the circumstances they were raised in, um, their nervous system capacity, their level of ability to create co-regulation, which is safe setting and receiving of safe signals or not, impacts their capacity to um, raise a child in a certain way, where there's attunement or lack of attunement. Their socioeconomic background and where they actually live really matters also. And depending on um, socioeconomic background, uh, levels of trauma of the existing parents or their parents, et cetera. Uh, we get behaviors that get passed on. We have gene expression that gets passed on. And we have um, uh, trauma from the environment that gets passed on. Um, meaning, for example, I have uh, clients who are African-American or people who are born and raised in Africa, for like example, Nigeria. And so they have similar and almost identical color skin. But clients that I have from Nigeria have a very different association to what it means to be have black skin than someone who was raised in America because there's super danger signals happening right. in this country if you have that skin color versus if you're in Nigeria, you don't have that same level of danger being projected upon you for your skin color. And so generational trauma is environmental. It's attachment-based, meaning relational, and then also epigenetic, meaning it shows up in your genes. 
um, and you can change your genes. So if someone is to say that I don't have intergenerational trauma, I would say that's something that someone with intergenerational trauma would probably say. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> because we haven't had a way to deal with it yet, you know? Right. And so. that's where it just feels like there's a big disconnect because it feels like to the initiated and, you know, and especially for people that um, come from a family of alcohol is like, for me, um, workaholism, deadly eating disorders, addiction, and so forth. It's like, oh, yeah, something's off, right? And then there are others where it either takes them a long time or, I mean, there was somebody on the show recently that um, he ended up trying psychedelics in his 40s. And he was saying, before I tried the psychedelic, like so, like a psilocybin trip, um, everything was fine. And then, then it was through taking that substance that he realized just how much trauma he was carrying. And it feels like that feels like the disconnect. It's like if you heard enough to take some initiative, otherwise, you know, otherwise it's normalized. And it's like, why, why is everybody, you know, wham, 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 why is everybody complaining? <laughs> right. It just, it feels like there is just a big, you know, kind of, uh, you know, information gap. I think that there, well, there is, that's because there is a big information gap. Oh, and okay. I think that um, it's not, I mean, there I'm is, not wrong. Yeah, yeah, there's a big information <laughs> gap. And I think also you invoke psychedelics. So, I mean, psychedelics have been used for thousands and thousands of years in indigenous tribes for all kinds of therapeutic and spiritual purposes. And if you look at like uh, when MDMA was synthesized, LSD was synthesized, et cetera, they were synthesized in a therapeutic context by clinicians and, and scientists who wanted to use it to help people heal. And then in 1970, there was an act passed that basically pushed them all underground. And Timothy Leary and all his friends and followers kind of got suppressed and stuff like that. Um, and they went underground uh, and became party drugs because they were illegal. So it was the prohibition of these things that caused them to be associated with these party uh, situations rather than a therapeutic context. However, now Leary students like Midhoffler and all these uh, all these guys, um, Doblin and Maps and stuff like that, um, they are older, wiser, and have access to funding and scientific research and have been publishing papers for 20 or 30 years and have established enough grounds where we can say, hey, like this stuff actually works as intended originally. So I think of it as like Leary's revenge from the grave in many ways. Um, it's his, it's his uh, homage. Um, and what happens when you do any type of uh, work where you're going to start to pay attention to your insides, your body, um, yeah, you're going to notice what's uncomfortable first. And so it's fine, meaning the status quo is there and I'm very good at dissociating, not paying attention to, not feeling, not having my feelings turned on, but I'm also not living a fully alive life. So if I want to live a fully alive life in the present moment, the first step, unfortunately, is to befriend our uncomfortable emotions. And that's something that people don't want to hear, but it's no different than going to the gym and saying, I have to go work out and it's hard, right? Like you don't get to have a strong, fit, healthy body without going to doing hard work repetitively over time. The same thing is true with emotional muscle is that we have to build our emotional muscle and be able to experience the full range of our emotions, positive, negative, comfortable, uncomfortable, without becoming dysregulated and taken out. So it's about being able to take a hit without being taken out emotionally. And so a big piece of the book that we talked about is this idea of having a flexible nervous system, which is how much capacity do you have for different ranges of emotions? Because if you only have the capacity for one, two, three, four responses to a situation, you're not going to be able to have a very fulfilling, meaningful life. And so um, there's an information disconnect, but there's also a lack of awareness around, oh, how do I even handle and navigate uh, uncomfortable emotions? People really want to attenuate and uh, amplify the positive emotions, but there's a, there's a lack of, uh, the term is affect phobia. There's a fear of emotion uh, and a lack of awareness and understanding of how to navigate those emotions. So everything was fine before the psychedelic trip because I was dissociated. Right. <laughs> oh, right. right. Yeah. Because I've kind of <laughs> yeah. numbed out and, and yeah. it's adaptive to, to kind of, you know, you talk about dissociation and how, how common that is. And, um, you know, or people just be, you know, kind of remaining in ignorance. There is a certain, uh, you, I think you used the phrase stuck is safe. Yes. And so it's like the idea of like, okay, maybe I'm not thriving, but I don't have, but I, I can kind of hang here where this experience is predictable. It's normal. And I'd rather do that than, um, walk into the flame. Right. But it's like what we're being called to do is to walk in the frickin flame. <laughs> right. I mean, kind of. Yeah. Well, and I think everyone's called. Not everyone answers and not everyone has to answer. And I think that this book, this book is not for people who want to stay the same. 
This book is for ambitious people who want to grow and heal and reach another level in their life and um, can help them uh, understand the predictable blocks that will come up as they start to become uh, and step into more. And so if you're ambitious, you're, you are being called into the fire and there is a price to pay. Just like there's a price to pay if you want to have emotional, I'm sorry, physical fitness, there's a price to pay to have emotional fitness too. And so there's the there's there's a price of avoidance and there's a price of going into it. And well, it's that's which what I was going to add. You talk about the price of avoidance as well, and that I think that it's unfortunate that 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 so many people are willing to pay the price of avoidance um, because that that known comfortable. Um, life is it it's safer even even if it's uh inferior so why did you so just to to really you know have you kind of put a fine point on it why after writing some other books and you know doing all the work that you've done yourself and in the world why did you decide to write this one in particular uh, um i think it was like frustration probably is the answer if i'm really honest uh because you know i think about like where the world's heading right now and i, I i've known about and been interested in artificial intelligence for probably 20, 25 years. I've studied the work of Ray Kurzweil for that long. And he's talked about this moment called the singularity where AI becomes smarter than us, which is in our near future. So I've always been very curious about the time that we're stepping into right now. And what I've noticed is that we can uh, have these amazing electric cars uh, that go faster than a Lamborghini, which I love, by the way, at a stoplight, super fun moment for me. Love that moment. Um, we can p make plans to colonize Mars. We can do all these incredible things with artificial intelligence. And yet, like Elon Musk, for example, who's like probably one of the pioneers of, of tech and innovation and all these things, denies that there's any value in discussing the impact his father had on him. And and it's like, yo, bro, like, no. Like, he's he's public about that. And I've been saying this for probably 15 years. Like, this is not the way. And the reason why is because think of it this way. Everything that we experience in our life is experienced through our nervous system. The joy, the, the, the sorrow, the trauma, the healing, all of it is experienced through our nervous system. So understanding the first principles of how our nervous system works, how it holds trauma, how it can be reprogrammed to release trauma and to be able to uh, have better capacity to handle negative emotion and all these different things seems as obvious as understanding the first principles of physics if you want to understand the universe. And so Elon, for example, has specialized in mastering the laws of physics, electricity, and I would argue he knows very little about the nervous system, except for in the context of Neuralink, as it relates to brain, uh, how the brain anatomy, but as it relates to lived embodied experience of trauma, until we have people like Elon Musk saying, yo, um, all this stuff is super important, but until we understand the nervous system, like let's pause on this, we have a problem because the, why is it that the richest people in the world want to leave this planet? Because they can't be in their own nervous system. Newsflash, Elon, your nervous system will go with you to Mars. Okay? <laughs> All right, can okay? we, that's going to be a social media <laughs> clip. Well, and you know how I would frame it is, uh, you know, I feel like the promise of America has been you know, pioneering and conquering new lands and all about what's outside of us. And we have kind of going back to the earlier part of our conversation, the price that we've paid, and I relate to this as a, as a family, wonderful family, but of entrepreneurs always looking outward and creating things. And meanwhile, our inner lives and our relational lives have um, been either ignored or abandoned Right. And it just feels like that that inner that sort of saying, I'm going to live from the inside out like there is tremendous power in that. So what would you say if you were interviewing Elon Musk right now? What would you say to him? Let's talk about your father. <laughs> OK, I don't want to talk if about you my don't father. Want, OK, so <laughs> why why don't you want to talk about your father? Right. I would guess we would unpack the protect, there's a lot of protectors around that. Right. But think of it this way. I'll, I'll give you like a, a sort of a SpaceX analogy. Right. So if you understand laws of, of physics and, and, and how flight happens, right, aerodynamics. Right. So the reason why it takes more fuel to get a rocket into space than it does from the edge of space to the moon is because of gravity and things like air. All this all this energy is holding you down. That's exactly what trauma does. And so it makes no sense to spend all this energy 
trying to outrun your trauma. When, when you can work with it, you can actually lessen that traumatic gravity and be able to use a lot more, a lot less energy to go a lot further. And so it's like, he's basically saying that trauma doesn't matter. And I'm like, trauma has a gravity to it. And so it holds you back. It, like, it, it creates yeah. drag. Yeah, in your, totally. It creates drag in your uh, momentum. And so, um, and if you look at like, and I'm, a, I'm not anti-Elon, I'm an Elon fan. But if you look at like, I don't know, the behavior over the last few years, it's really clear that there's some unresolved stuff there. Super, super clear. And so the problem is, is that people like him are thought leaders that people look to. And I really wish we could embody the Arthur Rimbaud quote that says, the interface of outer space is where we meet the dreams we race. So it's about the inside, conquering the inside, because the la honestly, the last thing we should be doing is spreading human suffering to other planets. That's the last thing we need to do. For the love of God, can we please have a trauma clearing like assessment or something so that if someone's going to go to Mars, that they're not going to be spreading trauma. We have a net zero trauma spreading policy to other planets. That would be very nice. Um, or um, even to the moon. It just doesn't, uh, make, doesn't make any sense. Mastin, have you ever thought about running for office? <laughs> I've thought about it, but it's not really, I think, my... my uh, my, my lane, at least right now. Not yet. Yeah, no, I mean, but this is like, to me, when I think about these things that are so back to the beginning of our conversation, so practical and so inconvenient. And it's like, oh, we just want to like do away with all that inconvenient stuff. And yet when you do back to, you know, so many families, so many organizations, societies and so forth, sweep, sweep, sweep it under the rug, but you still pay a price and that's, you know, I feel like that's the big disconnect. It's that w what feels like willful ignorance. Um, okay. So when it comes to, ner like, just as a really practical matter for people listening and like, oh, I'm not sure about all this generational trauma stuff, but I'm, I'm you know, kind of warming up to it. What would you tell them? Is there a hack or two or three or something they can take away from our conversation that can help them with their nervous system? Any, uh, like, quick practical takeaways? Yeah, a few. So a couple things. One, um, I think it's important to understand how the nervous system works, which we can talk about. But then what's more important is to understand how your nervous system works, which is different. Because you and I have similar wiring in terms of a nervous system, but your nervous system is going to respond differently to different cues or situations than mine is. Um, and then the big leap is to be able to understand other people have a nervous system and how does their nervous system work independent of your reactions. I think those three things are relatively simple ideas, but have profound impact on the quality of your life. Because basically, all of life is driven by relationships. And what are relationships but nervous system interactions? That's basically what they are. And so if you don't understand how your nervous system is operating, if you don't understand how the other person's nervous system is operating, and that means you don't understand how they're interacting. And if you don't understand how they're interacting, then you don't really understand how to have informed relationships, whether it's professional relationships, romantic relationships, uh, friendships, et cetera. And so I think being curious about your own nervous system, and I think the number one question I would ask someone is, how able are you to be with something that feels difficult? Mm -hmm. How able are you? Can you turn that difficult emotional state, difficult somatic or physical sensation into a friend? Can you befriend it? Can you be curious about so it? Use, because, use an example because that yeah. can feel a little theoretical. So like either like in your, like, how do you do that? Like, sure. Like, like, like if you feel sadness, a lot of people feel sadness in their diaphragm or kind of like right below their chest. Right. So it's like, instead of feeling sadness and then choosing the happy thought, it's like, get curious. Like and, and you literally put your hand on your body and go, okay, so how old do you think I am? And why are you sad? What are you keeping me safe from? Why are you here? How did you get your job? Right? Um, what am I missing? Oh, thank you for all the ways that you've kept me safe that I know about that I don't know about. And many times the part will just be like, cool. Okay. Because there's a recognition. What happens is we tend to treat certain emotions in our system, sadness, anger, et cetera, depending on how we were raised, like our parents did. So uh, John Bowlby, I think it was John Bowlby, founder of attachment theory, said, what cannot be expressed to the mother cannot be expressed to the self. Man, and so a big you. piece of healing your nervous system and then certainly growing is learning to express things to yourself that you were not able to express to others growing up and being having that be okay with you. 
Okay, so let's just rewind. I, I do the exercise with me. You're a super famous life coach, so I'm going to be your uh, I'm going to be your client for a minute. So <laughs> okay. I I'll sometimes have anxiety, and I'll feel a right in my chest. And yeah. so, so and, and everybody it, listening, do it with sternum? me. Yeah, like, like it'll be area? like like it's like oh like and I'll, oh it's like the word oh I just like I can't like it's just painful. So right? let's so just I'll be think, you know thinking in my head I'm like I just want to get rid of this terrible feeling. Sure. So what do I yeah. do? So the first thing I do is the part of you that wants to get rid of it, where do you feel that part? I mean, right right in my uh, prefrontal cortex, like right in my brain. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay. like, so I, I part, want that to go away. So for the part that wants then, to get rid of it, wants it to go away, why does this part want it to go away? Because it it's uncomfortable. Okay. And I mean, why, I, really, I feel an ache in my chest. I understand. but And why would you? Why would the part of you that wants the ache to go away... Why would that part want it to go away? Okay. So this part that wants it to go away wants you to not hurt. Okay. For the part of you that wants you to not hurt, what would it want you to rather be doing besides hurting? Feeling joyful. Okay. And, so, and if I'm being honest, if it's hurting in the morning, it's like, I have a freaking busy day. <laughs> I don't have time for this. Don't have time for this. Okay. Got it. So, okay. And what happens if you don't have time for something? Uh, I get stressed. And if you get stressed, what happens? You oh, don't have God. time for it. I, I I mean, I I end up being crabby with my husband, crabby with my kids. Then I feel guilty. Okay. So like, so oh, so I it's like, better. oh, if I so if I feel if I feel this ache, now I'm gonna have a negative impact in my relationships also. I don't have time to feel this, then I get stressed. So it's not just about you, it's probably more about also how you're impacting others. So this part wants you to feel joyful, but also wants the people in your life that you love most to feel joyful too. Yeah. And you said guilt, but you didn't use this word. I'm going to throw a word at you that, that you didn't use. Does that part feel like when you're sad that you're like a burden? Uh, to others? Maybe. Yeah, I could I could see that like at you're times. Bringing, like you're bringing them down? That and, oh, and, or the opposite of that. For me, one of my like big, uh, the thing I'm trying to conquer is I don't feel like I'm enough. So if I'm not bringing my A game, you know, it's a disappointment because I need okay, to bring my A game. There it is. You know? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so disappointment. Okay, great. Now, notice we haven't talked about the ache yet. <laughs> we just Why talk, did I we ask talk... you to do this with me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We can stop. We can stop anytime you want. No, so no, you're no. In the chair. This is you good. No, it's good. Okay. So just notice. I want to get rid of it. I don't want to hurt. I want to feel joyful. I don't have time for this. I feel guilty. I, if I don't bring my A game, I'll be disappointing, and I don't want to impact negatively the people that I love most. Right. So, when did you learn? that being sad negatively impacts the people that you love most or being anxious negatively impacts the people that you love most. Um, I mean, I guess when I'm little, I guess I have a hard time actually sort of visualizing little, you know, the little Andrea in that exact moment. But I guess it, you know, it seems logical that that comes from childhood. Okay. And so the part of you that's trying to get rid of it, mm -hmm. How did that part get its job? Oh, because that part is, I mean, like responsible, reliable, stay in control, right? All those, all those um, attributes that lead to, you know, the kind of the the success, being enough, right? All of all of that, you know, sort of achievement kind of stuff. So then, it, I'm going to take a wild guess. My guess would be then when you were younger that there were people who were not responsible, not reliable, who didn't have control. And you learned that if you did it, then things got done. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Yeah. And how old do you think that part is that learned that? Yeah, uh, probably really little, you know, six, seven, eight. Okay. Maybe so we younger. have a six, seven, eight year old. Now the term for that is called being parentified, where a child takes on the responsibilities of an adult. And so we have a six year old that's like, um, I need to get rid of this so that my family's okay. I got to bring my A game so that my family's okay. Now, what's the this that she wants to get rid of? Well, that that feeling of um, of of hurt and discomfort, yeah. I guess. That's right. okay. So, if and what it and I guess what it you know it's like ooh what it represents. I mean, if I'm being honest, what it represents because when I'm in that mode. It's like all that old stuff that I'm trying to, um, I mean, escape, if I'm being honest, escape from, mm -hmm. you know, the hurt. overcome, the, the you hurt know, grow from. The hurt. The hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's think about, do you feel that hurt in your chest? Not now. I mean, not now, but yes. I mean, when I do feel it, it's like right there, right in my okay. chest. So let's ask the hurt 
how old that part thinks you are? Uh, how old it thinks I am now? No, how old oh. it thinks you are. Like, or how old is it? Mm. Ooh. Yeah, old. I mean, a, yeah, I would say yeah. uh, it's been there a long time. You know, kind of, it, it kind of comes in and out. But if I'm being honest, uh, in fact, I think for six, a long time, seven, eight, or younger. Um, uh, I mean, on a, it's hard to say, but yeah, that sounds about right. So around the same time. Okay. Okay. So the hurt part, if we just take the the part that's trying to control it for a second, we just let the hurt part speak. What does it wish would happen? Um. I think it would wish that uh, that it it didn't. I mean, I'm going to state the obvious: like it didn't hurt. It, and but even going, you know, again, rewinding a little bit, that all that that's caused that right from having so much doubt and carrying, um, you know, heartache and so forth forward in my life. That it's like, ooh, I would just love for that to go away so it doesn't continue I think to be you're speaking burden. from the part that wants it to go away again and not letting oh. the hurt part speak I could oh. be wrong but what do you think <laughs> I don't know I, yeah I let's mean, think about that first because he just said I want it to go away right okay. so that's not the hurt part right so oh maybe right? it's like okay so I, I take your point maybe that hurt point hurt part is saying um fucking pay attention yeah there we go mm -hmm. and so the part that wants it to go away is okay so the way that I get people to pay attention is being on my A game right so if I'm on my A game, people will pay attention. If I'm not on my A game, basically, these are not your words, but basically what you're describing is a neglect. Yeah. So yeah. in this context, what we want to be able to do is say, hey, so there's a part of you that's like feeling neglected and wants someone to pay attention. There's another part that said, well, the way it's going isn't working. Let me be on my A game. Let me be the one who can be responsible, reliable, and control. Then people will pay attention to me. But what we really want to have a corrective emotional experience is for the part of you that feels hurt and for someone to pay attention is to pay attention to you in a way that's not performative and to just love you for you. And the more that you can bring that into your uh, relationships with the people who are closest to you, the better. Right. And so um, does that make sense? It totally does. And what's interesting is like, oh my God, this is great. And it really, it just reminds me so much of, of like taking your book and applying it where it's like um, making peace with that part of myself rather than saying, I wish it would go away. And I want to come back to uh, how, how you spoke to your ankle, which is a great story. Uh, it really is. It's a, it really is a, it's a beautiful exercise because my, my MO has been, oh, frick, it's back. Can it just go away? Versus saying, what do you need to tell me? Right. Let and me be patient. Can I, and here's, here's a, here's a, a, a reflex you haven't developed yet. To be able to have that self-talk, and bring it into relationships. Like uh, this part's up right now for me. Like, can you love me without me being on my A game? Is that possible? Can I just like have a messy day? Would that be all right? Right? Like being having that because trauma like this is relational. So you don't heal relational trauma on your own, contrary to Instagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, relational trauma is healed relationally. Um, mm -hmm. And being able to, and, all, and by the way, awareness. all trauma is relational, right? So can we just say that? Um, probably. Almost? Okay. Probably. Probably. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. I have to think about okay. that. Um, okay. A lot of it. Um, and so the part that wants to get stuff done can realize that I can get more done through the vulnerability of bringing this part into my relationships than by suppressing her. And what we want to create are more experiences of that now. That's a little bit of uh, sort of trauma healing that we did right there. Lots of things that, that we called that. There's lots of modalities that use that process that we just went through. But <clears throat> where the trauma healing stuff stops is when we think about the future. Let's say that you normalize this pattern the way that you are now. The second you start making things harder, you start becoming more ambitious, you start wanting more, guess what's going to happen? This upcycles again. And so what happens is you're going to be, if, if you're trying to be ambitious and grow, you're going to have this part that gets hurt, that's not feeling seen, that's not being noticed, and the part that pops in that's like, I got to get rid of it, but I'll be on my A game and get stressed and you'll be all isolated again. So that's now a predictable cycle we can predict will happen as you level up next time. So the best thing to do is to know that about yourself and then to recruit the people in your life to know that about you also so that when you're leveling up, you can level up and not have it be performative level up. It can be an authentic level up. 
where you Meaning, get support like vulnerably. I can talk to them, like I can talk to them about it yeah like can and they can and we can plan ahead and say look how are all the what are the five or ten ways that Andrea's like performative part that needs to control everything shows up every time things get super intense and super like leveled up let's look at probably five or ten predictable ways let's notice that and then reverse engineer what can we do in the beginning of the situation to like not make that so activating for her mm-hmm. right and then Ooh, also, be a, that but master that implies asking for help <laughs> exactly exactly hard uh-huh. yeah, no, i got you you're you're you're, you're i mean wow I, I i'll give you 200 bucks or you probably charge more than that after this uh, little bit, little bit, session i yeah. know uh, but really it but you're right it's like i you know hyper as i describe myself um a type triple a uh aries you know super ambitious and it's like let me just contain myself and then not not call on other people to help because like it doesn't that isn't comfortable for me and and then you know it's like then it's a pain for other people and so forth. So, but yeah, it's you're, okay to you're, you know you're it's okay to burn me out in a really nice way. <laughs> you asked me to. Just so I did. Yeah, I did. I totally um, did. But it's okay to burden other people, like if they're in your life in a meaningful way, right? Because everyone's a burden at some point. Well, I would even argue if I was giving the advice, I would say not only is it, I mean, to somebody else, not to me, haha. Not only is it okay to to burden other people, it is required, right, to be needed is important like we we all need to be needed and you're right like that's a it's something that i'm i'm so loath to do and it's a great it's just a really prof- i mean honestly like profound reminder for me to like take my own medicine over here you know yeah and i think that what happens if you don't do this work like this is we just recreate the dynamics of our family of origin in our business or in other relationships or whatever and so it's like the same situation just manifested differently and so doing this work and, and making the, the 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 connection inside, like I have this hurt part, I have this part that wants to get rid of it. I go off into this triple Aries story around all these things, right? And I'm super responsible, super reliable, super in control. That's my way of justifying doing it all by myself and not asking for help. I'm going to commit to not doing that as much also and can create agreements between me and the people that I love most in my life to lovingly nudge me when they see me doing that because they'll see you doing it before you notice you're doing it mm-hmm. <laughs> yep i'm our uh, master i'm gonna be totally calling you i mean like, <laughs> be part of my team you'll get it <laughs> now I, that it really it's it's wonderful um to go through that i hope for everybody listening i hope you went through it and just even just as a like just to recap as a practical matter feeling those feel i mean like this idea of you know the nervous system to me i love the phrase the embodied brain and so this idea of, oh my gosh, our body is telling us something and, and let's not be like me where it's like, oh, I just wish it would go away, you know, as a really practical matter to heal, to say, okay, what, you know, how can I listen? How can I be sympathetic? You know, and, and just that exercise that you went through. Well, and will you, will you this is how it goes away though. This is how yeah, it goes Yeah, yeah, no, away. exactly. So that well, wish is a good wish. Your... It's the way you figured out to make it go away is not sustainable. A hundred percent. And that you're right to emphasize that. Um, And you're also right. I always, you know, I write my journal all the time. And when some of these things come back, I always say to myself, ooh, this is mastery. Right. So to your point that when you're leveling up and going deeper, that there are certain patterns that uh, reemerge. And, you know, again, just like probably trying to remind myself when it happens to me it's like oh yeah this is mastery you know the, because at times I feel guilty I'm like what the frick is wrong with me like why didn't I master that like oh my god I've been trying so hard and so I end up just like compounding the hurt and heartache that I'm experiencing by then feeling guilty and then it's like negative self-talk like frick Andrea like why have you done this again right but the truth is the experience of um of either backsliding or screwing it up is part of the, it, it's a predictable part of the process is what you're saying. Very predictable. And also like, if you think about that guilty part, guilt is the price, feeling guilt is the price you pay to come into relationship many times. Okay. Why is that? What does that mean? Because many times we don't want to hurt or burden or disappoint other people. And when we do, we feel guilty about it. Right. And so if I actually want to be in relationship, I'm talking about you specifically, right? Like it feeling guilty is the price you're going to pay for secure functioning relationships in your life. Uh, oh, oh, snap. Holy smokes. 
I'm going to have to like clip this and like rewind and listen to it again. Like, oh my God, what was that that Mastin said to me? Okay, yeah, no, yeah, because, I got it. Because, big... in, 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 uh -huh. you, you, yay, I love that. So like, how should I put this? Like you didn't use this word, but I'm going to throw it on there and you can take it off if you want. But like perfectionism is kind of what you're talking about. Oh yeah. So like the cure for perfectionism is not getting everything right. The cure for, the cure for perfectionism is the capacity to repair to know that it's okay for things to not go well and to know that things can not go the way that you think they're going to go in this controlling part way and to have it be a little bit of a mess and then to have the repair process happen and go, oh, like I can mess up and there's no like negative relationship impact. Great. Awesome. Amazing. Right. Versus like I have to get it right because otherwise I'm going to be all alone and I have to get it right. I don't want to be alone, so I'm going to do it all alone. So now I'm still all alone, even though I don't want to be all alone. Oh, my God, Master, I cannot tell you how much I freaking hate making mistakes. I, it's like, oh, it's like the worst. And I, it's just, it really, it's like, I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm like a lot of people hard on myself. It's so painful to make mistakes. It's like, what the frick? So do we better. found the limit of your nervous system flexibility. So your flexibility is up until the point where you make a mistake, relatively flexible, but you don't yet have the flexibility to make a mistake and have it be okay. So that would be the next level for you. Yeah. But I'm only saying that to you because you asked me to. No, so I don't no, just no, go totally. Into, you're, you, yeah. you're amazing. This is like a lot of ahas. I'm, I'm super grateful. And I, again, I hope everybody listening who's going through the exercise along with us is having a similar kind of aha but talk about since we're on the topic talk about your how you talk to your ankle how you couldn't walk it's a crazy story mm. well yeah so speaking of not paying attention to your parts and wanting to get rid of things um so that's definitely something i've tried hard to do um so i uh i was injured in high school um with my uh ankle and uh, also fell down some stairs and almost died in high school. It's a lot of a couple of injuries happened in high school that weren't so great. Um, and I was an athlete, and then couldn't be an athlete anymore. So I was sad about that. And then, so I came out to Los Angeles, got into the music business, uh, discovered cocaine and rock, you know, rock and roll, um, and got in and out of that very quickly over a few years. Did a lot of big things, and then kind of got on this personal development journey. And uh, my father's a scientist, my mother's a scientist, so very much like heady conversations. And I never really got into my body when I was a kid. Um, and then had so much pain, I didn't want to be in my body. And then addiction took me out of my body even more. And so as I got into doing the work I do now, starting the Daily Love, uh, a blog uh, that was very popular for a long time, um, and then getting into coaching and then touring and events and seminars and stuff like that, I would train, but my feet would start to hurt. And my low back would start to hurt. And as time went on, you know, stretching, massaging, whatever, these different things, I was like, well, the football guys do Toradol. So that's what I'll do. I'll do like inject Toradol into my body to make the pain go away. And, and Toradol, so is that like a... It's, like a, it's like... a super, super, super extra, extra, extra strength Advil, <laughs> basically. Oh, okay. But is it... Okay. So like a... Uh, what is it called? Like a... An NSAID. Okay. It's an NSAID. It's a, it's a prescription NSAID. So um, anti-inflammatory. And so it's the same thing as Advil, but just way more way more intense. Um, and so that was my solution for many years just to make it go away. Um, and then I would take, you know, like different um, steroids, like uh, anti-inflammatory steroids to make it go away and stuff like that. And I was doing all this stuff all over the world, traveling so much. And then COVID happened and um, we had to pivot to a virtual only business. I was a live event business. We used internet marketing to drive live events, but we never really used internet marketing to virtual. So that was a big pivot. But around that same time, I had about 10 or 15 years of not paying attention to my body kind of add up. And I could not walk for six months. And I was and I was like, double the Toradol, double the what like, just just like cut it what, off. And, and like literally like nothing was working. And I was like, oh my God, I'm on steroids and Toradol and it still hurts. Like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is so insane. So one day I was like, Ugh, I have to do parts work on myself. And I was like, no, like, no, I was like anything but that. But I was in so much pain. I couldn't walk. It was like throbbing. I had to crawl up the stairs one night. Like, it was oh. just like awful. Oh, you awful. were, so you were literally on your knees. Literally. Like I couldn't, your, your like, body was like, like, yo, pay yeah, attention, bring you to your knees. No, my body was like, fuck you. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, And so I just, one night just like, it was mostly on my left side. And it was mostly my left inner ankle. I, I just grabbed it. And I was like, okay, okay. Obviously, you're trying to get my attention. <laughs> Obviously. So whatever it is, 
I don't know what it is, but obviously you don't want me to move forward because I literally can't move forward. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm. That's got to make Ooh. sense on some level. I don't know how it makes sense, but it makes sense. Thank you for not moving. Thank you for helping me not move forward. Show me why. And then basically uh, for like two or three hours, I just relived so many moments of feeling neglected in my life. And because I do the work that I do and I've done lots of psychedelics and like facilitated 20, 30,000 hours of people and stuff like that, like I can hold a pretty solid space for myself to handle hard emotion. Um, I wasn't prepared for it, but it happened. Like normally you'd probably do this with a trained practitioner, which I am, <laughs> but you know, like, and it was in COVID and I didn't, it wasn't, on per- wasn't trying to do any somatic work or anything like that on purpose, but it just happened. And I saw all these memories of all these times I felt neglected. And I was like, oh my God, like I wouldn't want to move forward either. If all you think my future is going to be and our future is going to be is this neglect. And I said, I promise to pay attention to you from now on. And this is over the course of like a four or five hour like experience. And and you talked about, I think you referenced this in your book, how it was just super emotional and. Yeah. Oh yeah. I no, I was like crying. It's not crying. It's like, the just whole like thing. in the bathtub, just oh. like, you know, oh. just like oh. uh, all the things like power, all mm. these things. Mm. And, uh, and then within like three to four weeks, it kind of had like calmed down. And I had my dear friend, Adam Cobb, uh, came to Asheville where I was at the time and really helped me get literally get back on my feet. When I say that, I mean literally get back on my feet. Um, and um, but what between... did he, was he doing physical therapy or what was Adam doing with you? <sighs> There's nothing he can't do. Adam is a Adam is a unicorn. He does. Um, he's a he's a performance coach for athletes and actors primarily. Um, and I sort of uh, convinced him to come to Asheville and help me out during the pandemic, and it was kind of perfect timing. Um, but he he knows a lot about fascia and he knows a lot about the body and movement and hydration and functional medicine and nutrition and all the, I mean, he's like, he's like a one-stop shop for so many things. And I'm only now like, I don't know what I'm four or five years later, really understanding half the stuff he said to me in 2020. And I'll like, every once in a while I'll voice memo Adam and I'll be like, Hey, uh, so you know what? You're right. My right glute, like I've been working on it because there's this hip imbalance. He's like, I told you, you know, it's really funny, you know, like, but I had to get it on my own time, you know, but he's been very patient with me and I love him very much. Um, But he literally helped me get back on my feet and it's been this slow and steady kind of realignment of my skeleton, of my fascia, like everything mm-hmm. happening in my body. And that's why. And hang on, book, fascia, just for those who aren't familiar, it's like the connective tissue. Yeah. It's this webbing our, our, in between everything. Our bones and muscles and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the connective tissue in between everything. It communicates faster than the nervous system. It's a very fascinating substance. Um, and we store a lot of stuck emotion and uh, tension and stuff like that in the fascia. And so I've just been, and I've been just practiced this now for four or five years and I'm getting back into alignment. But part of that getting back into alignment is understanding my true capacity for what I'm able to do and not be, go outside of, uh, become too dysregulated by it, which is why instead of launching this book where like everything hits in one week, it's this big, exciting thing, all these things. My goal is the book is out and I want to, get a hundred thousand copies of the book in people's hands, not in a warehouse somewhere with a bought and paid for bestseller campaign. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. No right? real, like you really no. want people to actually yeah. get the book, read it, Correct. apply it. Yeah. Because Amen, I feel like brother. if a hundred thousand people, thank you. I think if a hundred thousand people do that, we'll create an inflection point because a lot of the science in the books, usually science takes about 20 years to go mainstream. I want it to go faster than that. And so my hope is that we can create that inflection point. And I'm really doing this book in a more vulnerable way. Um, in terms of uh, promoting it and launching it in a much more slow and steady way than I have in the past and asking for help. It's been very difficult to do. Um, but I've been so amazed at how many people have showed up to help and support, including you, which I'm very grateful for. And um, it's a, it's a, someone asked me when the book came out on the day it came out, oh my God, are you excited? How do you feel? I go, how do I feel? I feel like I just started a marathon. Yeah, like you just had a you know. baby and now all the work is in front of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. Like I feel like I just yeah. got drafted in the NFL. Like I didn't yeah. win. Like the work begins or something like yeah. that. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's how I feel. Um, and so that's 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 kind of my approach uh, and really embodying the principles that I've learned here. And also my last two books, both when they came out, sold more than people who were on the New York Times bestseller list but didn't make the list because the list is very um, – not well it has to happen in a, in a limited amount of time it's kind of a weird way of well it's assessing. also but it's also based on their like some decision that the people who made that decision make so like you can outsell new york times bestsellers and not make the list because it's not based just on sales so i was like the only reason i would do it is for my own ego which who cares that's gonna put too much stress on my system and most of the copies of my last book claim your power were sold after the first and second week because it has a beautiful life and it still sells to this day. So I was like, let's just take that same approach here. 
And so it's been sort of like a book launch opposite in so many ways. And, I've, and sometimes people uh, explain this to them. They kind of look at me like, dude, like, I don't understand. Like, that's, that's not how we launch books. So I'm like, that's not how you launch books, but that's how my nervous system wants to launch this book. That's how my nervous system wants to launch this book, which is one of one, you know? Yeah. I love that. I'm going to add, add on to that. Um, just sharing a little bit of a vulnerable story. When I wrote my book, uh, Radical Acceptance, The Secret to Happy Lasting Love, I remember being in the, and I, I put my whole heart into what we were talking about uh, before when we were doing our prep call, how I was blessed to interview people like Stephen Porges, uh, the father of the polyvagal theory, theory uh, Sue Carter, who discovered oxytocin. And I mean, like, I really, I went to the end of the earth and put my whole heart and my whole everything soul into this book. And it was not a New York Times bestseller. It wasn't a bestseller. And it broke me. And I came to the conclusion, it took me a few minutes, same conclusion that you've come to. It's not about my ego. It's not about getting on the bestseller list. It is really about getting into real people's hands and making a real impact on real lives. And if it's a, a fewer people and deeper, okay, great. If it's more people, I mean, you know, it's like, great, but let me not put my ego into the um, into that outcome. And it yeah. was, I mean, honestly, it's one of the greatest things. It brought me to my knees and it was such a beautiful revelation as freaking terrible as it was because it made me get really honest with, and it, and it's translated into my podcast, our, our podcast is translated into all the work that I do. It's like, don't do it for your ego. Don't do it for I me. Mean, yeah, you got to have numbers. You got to pay bills and, and so forth. But the driving force for me and my work and, and what I, I feel like you and I are kindreds, it really is to make an impact. Yeah. Right. And I, that in it, but it's humbling, that. right? To, to go, let me just feel that feeling of not making it about ego is like totally liberating. Big time. And I think people feel that. I think also more now than ever. And I think I think that um, the day of that sort of like top down, I know better than you kind of guru is kind of over. I think people want to be a part of the conversation and they want to know what's real, what's the real deal is that someone's going through. Um, and so that's also been a very important thing because I think like, and also one of the best selling books of all time, The Alchemist, took 10 years to get on the bestseller list, right? So it's like, Life is long. I don't know how many books Brene Brown wrote before. Oh yeah, you know, her, her first book, book it was published by Hazelton, a very small imprint for people that are familiar with the publishing world and and you know frankly the um, treatment world. It was like it did very little out of the gate, and now we. Yeah, know I think it was like I think Brene it was like Brown two story. or three books before she released um, Daring Greatly, and then guess what happened? Daring Greatly came out and it lifted her catalog also. Right. So like, and so for me, that's why it's more about steady state. It's about slow and steady. It's about impacting people. It's about the frustration of like, why don't we have this problem solved already? This problem should be solved in my opinion. Um, and less about Mastin Kip, New York Times bestselling author. Like I'm, I feel like I want to fall asleep when I hear that, you know, cause it's just, it's like, like there are people who are New York Times bestselling authors. Um, but like, I know, I know somebody who spent a year of their life working very hard to make that happen for them when their book came out, which happened for them, which I was very happy about. They were happy for three days and the hell that they put themselves through for that three days of happiness doesn't feel like the ROI doesn't, the juice doesn't seem worth the squeeze to me on that. You know, but when I have people come up, like I had a person with Air One the other day and someone was like, oh my God, I read your book in college to claim your power and it changed my life. That um, to me that's made me happy best. for like a week. Yeah. You know, yeah, you can, you can way better, that, you know, a long time. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Okay. I Just when you were talking about the juice isn't worth a squeeze, I want to just share the one little anecdote, just going back to the premise of, of your beautiful work. And just for people who are listening, who are willing to walk into the flame, I've walked into the flame. Mastin's walked into the flame. It's so worth it. Come walk into the flame with us, people. Um, you talk about Wayne Dyer always bringing a, an orange on stage and asking, you know, what's going to happen when I squeeze the orange? Well, you know, orange juice is going to come out. This idea of doing this work you get squeezed, the tough stuff comes out, and um, and and then something beautiful happens. You get orange juice, and, and maybe even more, <laughs> right? But I just love that metaphor, and I feel like these kinds of metaphors, when we're in that forge, when we're facing the flame, and it's scary, and it's painful to say, okay, this is totally what's supposed to be happening right now, and keep going. Yes, and have the faith that um, the science that backs all this stuff up is accurate because it comes from our attachment system and our attachment system has been evolving for millions of years. So like um, put your faith in your regulated state 
and um, also like find relationships that support that state for you also because it's not something you can do by yourself. Yeah, no, I agree. And it, it, just even to add on to that, in part why I wanted to start with your extraordinary story, yes, there is a science. And yet I feel like as people, when we think about others who have experienced the lowest of lows and hitting rock bottom and being reminded that other people have gone through equivalent or worse, you know, experiences where it's like, okay, I'm not alone. I, I, yeah. I can, you know, if they can, I can. Okay, we got to wrap. Mastin, you are amazing. Oh, thank you for thank having you. me. This has been such a lovely, enlivening conversation. It really has been such a joy to be here. Well, we got to bring you back. There's so much that Let's we do it. cover. Let's All do right. it. I'm here um, for it. Okay. So everybody, uh, Mastin's new book, Reclaim Your Nervous System, A Guide to Positive Change, Mental Wellness, and Post-Traumatic Growth. You can get it anywhere where you get books. You can listen. You can read. Um, but I highly recommend it. And let's be part of uh, Mastin's big ambition to get this book into 100,000 hands. All right, Mastin. Good luck. Thank love you. It. Thank you. He's so good. Oh, my gosh. I love him. That was um, great. What a, what a uh, like amazing story. I just I can't say it enough when I think about people like him and Abigail Disney and, and so many of these uh, children that come from great wealth and great power, how they are willing to... Um, stand up and be honest and call out the you know the good and the bad it just it gives me so much hope for humanity so very very grateful for Mastin and and his ilk um Brian what what were your big takeaways was there one or two things you're like boom that's on and I'm gonna put that into my life well one thing I thought was really fascinating was the the nuanced conversation about Elon and Neuralink and everything, mm -hmm. um, because that's one of the ones that it's so divisive. Obviously, I mean exactly. Elon himself is so divisive. Yeah, but it's so easy coming from a place of like, oh, Elon's a bad person. I don't want to mm -hmm. touch anything he's doing. Yada yada. I need to sell like, my Tesla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I love seeing the Teslas with the bumper stickers. Like I got this before we knew about Elon. No. Um, <laughs> I haven't but, seen that, but I could. I oh, I see them all the time. It's so it's funny. It's a little, little hypocritical. It's like, well, you could sell it. There's a, you know, you got alternatives well, over Rivian. I mean, Riv Rivian those, and... those early Teslas are so good, though. Yeah, but anyway, no, they are. Um, but I liked hearing, like, because, you know, again, as an Elon hater, it, it's easy to be like, oh, we don't want him messing with people's brains, right? Yeah. With the Neuralink, everything. But yeah. I liked it from the perspective of someone who is. A, like he said, like he's a fan of Elon, mm -hmm. like not necessarily everything, but yeah, the way he was able to uh, talk about the specifics of like, no, 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 you bring your trauma with you. Like, you know, oh, even you if bring you your go nervous to system Mars, with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, like that, all of that was like, that's the sort of conversation that needs to be happening instead of like, screw Elon. It's like, mm -hmm. no, let's actually talk about the thing. So I thought mm -hmm. that was really, really cool. I, I like that. Totally. I, I do, too. And I, I just I think just as a general, maybe even obvious statement, I mean, just for all of us to have more empathy and curiosity about each other, because it's so easy just to say, screw that guy. Right. And not care about what, you know, what what's behind the scenes or under the waterline that we don't know. I mean, I think the challenge there is just to um, Mastin's point that um, uh, Elon seems so devoid of curiosity you know, and, and, and I can also see that it's self-protection for him to say, you know, he's such an easy target for so many people that should he have an honest, open conversation about um, his relationship with his dad, that that could end up really backfiring. In fact, it reminds me of the ketamine um, discussion. Did you see the Don Lemon interview and just how Don kept, you know, and Don's a great interviewer, but I felt like at a certain point it was like, Okay, enough already about the ketamine thing because ketamine is authorized for medical use, and yes, some people use it as a party drug, but I that felt kind of yucky to me because it was like here's Elon being open, saying I am actually treating myself, and if Elon Musk, the wealthiest and one of the smartest people, met, you know, especially white men on the planet, can say, hey, I'm actually looking after my mental health in this way that is really interesting, rather than you know, pushing on it and pushing and pushing, you know, where he just he's like, shit, I didn't want to talk about it anymore. Like that was a mistake. I mean, I do feel like that's the you know, that's the the problem potentially. 
But yeah, I mean, it forces the, it forces those people to like further recluse back into their corner of yeah, not, not want to, not want to tell yeah. the truth and what's up and be vulnerable. Um, I I loved our I loved so much of our conversation. I really was so glad, and I honestly I didn't plan it uh, to indulge myself in that um, exercise that we went through. And it's just, it's amazing to me because in so many ways, it's such a practical, uh, you know, and like maybe even obvious um, process to go through. And yet so few of us go through that. Like instead, when we're feeling those aches and pains, whether it's with our ankle or the, the hurt in our chest, it's like, oh, I just want it to go away. And I love how he practically is saying, well, that doesn't work, right? So befriend it and like slow down and I mean, it just feels really practical to me. So I'm, I'm a fan. Well, that's nice, too, because especially mm -hmm. like, I mean, I've done it a million times in my life, but like you ignore it. You're like, oh, yeah. no, I'm not. I'm not feeling that. I'm just going to get used to it. Well, or yeah. just keep taking more Advil or take that. You yeah. Know, that, that cortisone shot. And good morning. Ibuprofen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's so much more. But I do love just even as a really practical matter, just this idea of like befriending those aches and pains what do they have to tell us and going back you know and it, it doesn't feel like it's like this freudian experience where you have to lie on the couch for 25 years and you know go through all this um crazy stuff but just as a really practical matter to say okay i'm just going to slow down and be curious like that that's like good there like that's free therapy i'm i'm down for it <laughs> All right, uh, this has been another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. We would love your feedback and advice. You are welcome to email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. We would be super grateful if you liked, subscribed, followed us wherever you get your podcasts on iHeart, uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Audible, you name it. Um, Brian, did I miss anything? That's it. I mean, leave us a comment. Let us know uh, oh. who you want to see on the show. Yes, <laughs> totally. Leave us a comment. What do you like? What do you hate? What can we do better? All right. Thank you. Have a great day.